Welcome, Evans, to the show. How are you doing, Evans? I'm doing great, Stephen. Thank you so much for having me on again. You're welcome. Welcome home. Well, thank you. I just got home last week from uh, Spain. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, I'm, I can't wait to ask you all about it, Evans. I, I guess the, the first question I want to ask you is, on behalf of our listeners, can you explain why Spain? Why you chose to uh, go on this lengthy journey to Spain? Okay. Um, there is a very famous ancient pilgrimage across northern Spain <clears throat> that we now refer to as the Camino, or the way in Spanish. And this uh, pilgrimage actually was, uh, it's, ca- it's a Catholic Christian pilgrimage, but it actually was well before Christian times into pre-Celtic ca- times. And there's been a resurgence in this interest in this particular pilgrimage. It was very popular in the Middle Ages. Millions of, of um, pilgrims went to the great holy city of Santiago in western um, Spain to see the bones of Saint James, who was Apostle of Christ, and it was a way to to get your indulgences and buy your way to heaven during the medieval times. It fell out of favor <clears throat> during the Reformation when Martin Luther said, "We well, don't need to buy indulgences any anymore." But it's had a resurgence in the last thirty years, and particularly the last ten years as people see the need to reconnect themselves with spirit and take these journeys and to um, um, challenge themselves on every level, physically, mentally, and spiritually. So um, I first heard about the Camino about uh, 20 years ago when I read um, Shirley MacLaine's book about it. And she's still talking about it 20 years later on Oprah just recently. That's how much it has informed her life. And then about five years ago, it started coming up. I started reading books about it. A friend who lives in Spain started talking about it. We threw around the idea of going. And then a couple of years ago, I gave my uh, daughter Alexandra a book about it. And she got the, the Camino bug. And then the movie with Martin Sheen, The Way, came out. And it became even more popular. So about a year and a half ago, she started saying, let's go to the Camino. This is my last summer before I graduate from college. Let's do a mother-daughter trip across the Camino. So I said, yes, and um, the, I started preparing for it about a year ago. Um, my children are grown. Um, I had a long year with elderly parents that finished up. And the summer, the time she had opened to go for college turned out to be three days after my 50th birthday. So no better way to celebrate a milestone birthday and get myself ready for the next half of my life than to take a grand pilgrimage. Interesting. It's fascinating, Evans. I admire you. So tell us how many, how many miles did you walk and how long did it take? Well, we left the United States on May 1st, and we started walking um, on May 3rd, and we are not big hikers and campers, so, you know, I had to work on getting my stamina up, so we decided that the best thing for us was about 12 miles a day. That's about five five, five to six hours a day of walking, and we felt that was a, a goal, so we gave ourselves uh, five weeks to walk. And um, we started on on a Saturday morning on a cold, rainy day in the Pyrenees. And we basically averaged 12 miles a day every day for five weeks, um, ending up um, through many, many different types of terrain, weather, um, type, you know, several different whole states of uh, provinces of um, Spain. To the other side, uh, almost to the coast, we were just uh, 60 miles from the coast in the holy city of Santiago, um, which is the Spanish word for St. James, and it's the third holiest city in Christendom after Rome and Jerusalem. So we walked every day, rain or shine, wind, cold, mountains, um, flat, uphill, downhill, um, for five, five weeks solid. 
Incredible. So, Evans, before you went on the trip, mm-hmm. obviously we know it's a, it, it's a, a pilgrim's a journey. Yes. And you, you've explained that in the Middle Ages, people used to uh, to to walk the Camino. Mm-hmm. Here and now, what were your objectives for taking this this incredible journey? And what is the reason most people walk the Camino? Well, everyone has a list of reasons, and I certainly had a long list of reasons. You know, time with my daughter, celebrating this birthday. Um, it, it made me more physically fit. For her, for my daughter, it was more of a physical challenge and a way to get away from the world. And I found a lot of the pilgrims, it was a physical challenge. It was it was a historic, you know, seeing through these beautiful historic towns, church and cathedral, and walking in the path of Charlemagne. This was he went he walked the Camino. Every great saint walks the Camino. In fact, I was lucky that this year is the 800th 800th anniversary of Saint Francis of Assisi walking the Camino, and so. Um, at the end, I went to the convent of St. Francis, the monastery of St. Francis in Santiago, and got a special certificate they only give out every hundred years to commemorate that. So, um, you know, I wanted to walk this particular path, which is called Santiago de Compostela, St. James, uh, James of the Field of Stars, because... The, this particular ley line, this energetic line through northern Spain, um, is aligned to the Milky Way galaxy. So ah, you're so it is about, along a longer a, a ley line. Yeah, it's a ley line. It's a ley line, and energy the energy lines that run through the Earth. This is a particular ley line that is also connected to the Milky Way galaxy. So you are basically walking along the Milky Way galaxy. And you're also walking along this line that millions of people, including these great saints, have said is important. So their devotion, their desires, their looking for miracles and asking for miracles are in the stones and embedded in every aspect of this particular um, pilgrimage. And so there's so much energy that can be that you find along this and so much anticipation of yourself for yourself and by the other pilgrims that you walk with that makes it very very different i mean i live near the appalachian trail and it's it's a wonderful place and it's sacred to walk but it doesn't have the same intensity of energy that this camino has and that's why i believe it's calling people um, a thou- for a thousand years or two thousand years, and um, I feel that the Camino, because it has had all this energy put into it by these millions of pilgrims, is almost its own entity, and it 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 almost you almost interact with it, and um, you bring yourself to it, and the Camino gives back the gifts that you've come to receive. Wow, how interesting. Well, Evans, can you explain to our listeners what ley lines are? Well, there's many ley lines around the world, and they're energetic lines that um, are natural within the earth. And when they cross, and some of the more um, well-known ones are in England, the St. Michael line, that is usually a holy place and Known or unknown, conscious or unconscious, that's where the peoples of the earth have put um, special sites, um, cathedrals, stone circles, um, things, and that like like Stonehenge and Glastonbury, the sacred sites of the western of our, our western traditions, and in the United States, um, the Great Serpent Mound is also on a ley line. They're just powerful energy lines that come through the earth. Um, and so, and they, you, they become more powerful like, like uh, Stonehenge is as people come there and worship there. It feeds the energy of those lines. And so the Camino has great energy to it. 
And as we know, a lot of these rocks are made of quartz crystal, and the crystal holds the memory. It holds the memory of the devotion of these people. And I found it much easier to get in that spirit of devotion as I walked, because I was walking with, I really felt that I was walking in the footsteps of all those people. I was with those people back a thousand years as I walked. I thought about those pilgrims many, many times. That's fascinating, Evans. So literally, many of the sacred sites across the world, so in Europe, for example, cathedrals and churches are actually Mm -hmm. built on these ley lines, these energy lines. Correct. And so therefore, they hold this more intense power of the earth. And so when the um, Gothic cathedral builders but these, these amazing monuments to God built them, and they have special sacred geometry. So you take the sacred geometry and the beautiful colors of the stained glass windows and the gold of the fronts and the devotion of the people and the energy of the earth, and you bring that all together in a, in a, in a, in a beautiful package that's why we keep being called to these sites and why we can meditate and read and do these wonderful things in our own homes. When you go to these sites, it's like, I, I almost have no other better, better way to say it, it's almost like getting an electric shock. It's like going there and saying, I want more too. I want, these, I want the power of these sites. I want to reach heavens. And because of the energy built up over the centuries in these places, whether they be churches or stone circles or, or these, those allow you to get into that space and change, change you. And for the rest of your life, you have that information to, to access. And, you know, I, I've been, I went to Canterbury Cathedral many years ago, and I went to Chartres Cathedral in France, one of the greatest cathedrals, quite a few years ago. And I still think about those days, and I think how eternal those days are. And um, each day on the Camino was like eternity. It was like a, I lived a whole lifetime each day, and it was such a joyful experience. The, day, the days that were hard physically were still a joy to be walking this ancient path. It was such a great privilege to be walking with the, with the saints, the people that have held the light for thousands of years. And so what did you feel as you were reaching these, uh, these important points along the journey, Evans? Did you feel... Uh, did you feel spirit? Did you feel inspired? Did you receive any messages or guidance for yourself? Well, um, every yeah, at you as you would anticipate the, the great cathedrals, and there were some unbelievably spectacular uh, cathedrals along this route, um, particularly the Burgos Cathedral. I've never seen anything like it, and I've been to many, many cathedrals. Um, there's that anticipation, and you can't wait to see it, and you think and you see that as the, as the, um, as the uh, pilgrim saw it. But I really loved the countryside. The, Spain, the countryside of Spain is absolutely spectacularly beautiful with wheat and um, flowers. The, the poppy fields were amazing. My daughter loves animals, so we saw and petted every animal, every kitten, every calf, and there was just the true joy of being. When you're outside walking in nature so many days in a row, and you've got those wonderful endorphins running through you, I just felt, for me, it was just the pure joy of living, just being alive. And because... I couldn't worry about my bank account. I couldn't worry about what people were thinking about me. All I had to do was walk and, and see the sky and see the trail. There was just so much joy and to spend so many days in joy. I, I, the joy is still it is overwhelming to me just thinking about it. The joy and, of being free to yeah. 
simply connect it, with, with spirit with and connect with oneself. Absolutely, it was oneself, and I purposely did not walk and talk with people. I just walked the path to be alive. And then in the evenings, we had just amazing times visiting with people from around the world, Australians and New Zealanders and Canadians and uh, Germans and French and Danish, just all with this one shared purpose of being alive, walking this ancient path together. And we would have amazing camaraderie, and there was instant connection with everybody you knew. Everybody was friendly, and that is one thing I've brought back, is wanting to be friendlier to people, wanting to connect with people more deeply, because it was just such a joy to make friends. And when we all got to Santiago, the congratulations of this huge monumental task of walking 500 miles and the sacrifices we had made to stay in these, you stay in hostels. So you're sleeping in a room with 30 other people sharing a couple of showers and a couple of toilets with people. You have just a, one set of clothes on your back. You, so you have sacrificed greatly to do this. You know, I would go 10 days without even riding in a car, just only walking. And it just puts you in a different time and a different space. And I think it really allows people to go deep within themselves. And I met people who had really worked out issues in their lives. And um, a lot of people were in transition in their lives, trying to figure out what was next. And, you know, I was also in this transition. And it was just a way of saying, okay, this is time for myself. This is time for me to be in touch with, with God in terms of in the universe, in terms of nature and these great historic sites. It's incredible. And Evans, I know that you've you've traveled extensively and yes. you've spent a lot of time in Egypt. Correct. And you've seen uh, incredible sites and had some amazing experiences in Egypt. Uh, how did the how did this spiritual journey compare with your experiences in Egypt? Um, well, it was equally wonderful. It was very different. And I always looked, I've been to Egypt three times now, and I always looked at going to Egypt as very much a pilgrimage because um, although I wasn't walking, you know, it was an arduous journey. I was going to a very foreign country. I didn't, you know, quite know what I was facing. But I was, again, wa going to these incredible power sites where people have worshipped these temples in Luxor where people have worshipped for five, six, ten thousand years. And the power that's there. And, you know, you don't take that lightly. A lot of people, the tourists, do take it lightly and they're taking pictures. But those of us who go for pilgrims, who go to those power sites to stand in that power, they, um, they are incredible. I, the first time I ever stood at Hatshepsut's temple. I never intended to. I just started crying. I could not, I could not look at it. It was just too much for me. I just, I never expected to have that reaction. But it just is such a powerful moment. And you're never the same again when you have gone to stand where the gods have been in ancient Egypt, or you, you go and you stand in these cathedrals that are just amazing monuments to God that that people have spent lifetimes building. You you come if you go with the reverence and the desire to be changed, you you do come back changed. And particularly with Egypt, people who go with such sacred intention to be with the gods and, and to communicate with these ancient the ancient knowledge, the ancient wisdom that we're trying to remember again the ancients knew things that we haven't, we've forgotten and we're remembering. Um, you do come back changed. And I see people's lives, including my life, change dramatically um, after these trips. And it's still too early to see what the Camino has done for me, although I've already seen, seen changes in how I feel and opportunities that are opening up. And they say the Camino really starts when you come home.
when you start implementing what you have experienced along the, the journey and when you've taken that time out to make yourself different. Do you find, Evans, that on these incredibly spiritual journeys, these pilgrimages, that you have realizations about yourself, about life, about spirit, about the world that you wouldn't necessarily have if you hadn't been on a pilgrimage? Oh, oh, definitely. I'm, I'm, uh, well, of course, I absolutely love to travel, but it's been since 2005 that I really really started going to places specifically to to meet the gods, to have this experience of being in this ancient land. And even though you're not getting it consciously as you're standing there, as you, you may not be understanding exactly what's happening, that information, those, the, the energy of those places, the knowledge that those places hold, get in your aura. They become part of you. And down the road you have access to this information for the rest of your life. You know, I know that I will think about standing in Shark Cathedral and walking the labyrinth in there, and then now that I know about the Camino and I've learned more through my other travels, I can go back and access that knowledge of, of Shark Cathedral and know it's there for me. So we, I might not say have a grand thought in the, um, at the moment, but those experiences are always there for me for the rest of my life. And I, strangely, I thought I would get to work out all sorts of things and think lots of thoughts on the Camino. Quite frankly, I didn't have a whole lot of thoughts on the Camino. I was just in the moment. And to have, and that's, isn't that what we're all trying to gather? You know, we talk about, Eckhart Tolle talks about being in the now. I spent five weeks in the now more than I've ever spent in my life as I walked. And there weren't a lot of thoughts. It was just the joy of the moment and the triumph of getting up those hills and the experience of meeting people and challenging myself on every level. That's what I learned. And Evans, you mentioned the the ancients, mm-hmm. uh, our great ancestors, that were building cathedrals or building uh, temples, pyramids. Uh, You mentioned that they had knowledge that we don't have. Mm -hmm. And so I'm drawing a a parallel, I guess, between your example of removing yourself from the day-to-day life in which we're so consumed by what's going on that Mm -hmm. we're not necessarily in the now and taking yourself away from that to... Uh, um, a a time and space that allows you to connect with yourself, to connect more deeply, Uh, taking our our lives, our world as it stands today uh, in comparison somehow with a person's everyday life and perhaps uh, disconnection from the, the deeper uh, source within oneself and spirit. Uh, how would you compare um, that with the uh, focus, knowledge, and magic of the ancients? Well, um, the ancient people, the the Egyptians, and the medieval Christians, the medieval Catholics that walk these paths, their entire life was their spiritual world. Um, There was nothing separate. The the spiritual life was constant in their life. They did not separate it out as we do, where we have our work days and we have our times with our children and we have our jobs. And we um, then may go to church Christmas. We may think about our spirituality for a few moments every day. But in those ancient worlds, in the medieval world too, those were completely infused. And if you go to the, the museums of the, of the Middle Ages, there is no art except sacred art, none whatsoever. The only thing they did was that. And then the same with the Egyptians. The only art was these temples and building them. And so we have fragmented our lives very deeply. And 
you know, one of the things I try to do, and in my website, it's called making every life, step of life sacred. It's bringing back that constant contact, and you may not be in prayer, you may not be saying the rosary, you may not be chanting, but knowing that your life is infused with the spirituality 100% of the day. My teacher says, you know, you never go more than a few seconds without a prayer. Your whole life becomes a prayer. And I think when you go to these places and you ask for that in these power spots, in these ancient spots, Every day, you, your life becomes a little bit more of that constant prayer, and the the prayer is the is coming and going. You know, it's the hearing hearing the the higher self, and it's also you know giving thanks and and gratitude. And there was so much gratitude on the on the in the Camino. Um, all the pilgrims were so grateful for everything. In five weeks I never heard a harsh word. There was never impatience out of another um, pilgrim. Sometimes we might grouse about having French fries yet again and we might complain a little bit about a snore, but it was always light hearted because our lives were stripped to the basics, the true basics of, of humanness, which was walking one set of clean clothes, lucky to have a bed, um, you know, just the true basics of life. You know, every day I hand-washed my clothes out, and I tr changed my clothes. I only had two sets of clothing. And so your life becomes really simple. And so then every little thing you get is just the biggest gift, and you have so much gratitude. And people talk about the miracles of the Camino. First of all, people watch the Camino for, for centuries to receive the miracles at these shrines. But every day there are little tiny miracles. Every moment is a miracle on the Camino. And you have nothing, but yet you seem to have exactly what a, um, another pilgrim needs. And it's remarkable to see. Alexander, my daughter, had met, met a young man a few days before, and we saw him again at this little town. And he was like, I don't know what to do. I can't go any further. My boots are killing me. I can't walk in them anymore. My walking sandals are, are, have broken. I don't have the money to go back to the town. I cannot go any further. I don't know what to do. And she said, wait a minute. I brought a second pair of sneakers because I couldn't decide which pair were correct for me. And Alexandra's a very tall girl. Well, sure enough, this second set of sneakers fit this young friend perfectly. And he was able to go on. So at the perfect moment, when he had nowhere to go, no place to buy another pair of shoes, here she had a second pair. She was probably the only person on the trail who had a second pair of sneakers. And there were miracles like that every day. So it, it, it had such a magical quality to it. And pilgrims were always there for each other, always there for each other. It reminds you that we, we're connected and we need to be there for each other. Exactly. And I think that I've met lots of people who have done the Camino twice, I, three times, four times. They do it every few years. I met a man who's done it 13 times. And it was the, I think a lot of it is the culture of the Camino is so loving, so giving, and so honest that people want to come back for that because that's what's missing in modern society, rush, rush modern society. Yes, it makes me want to hop on a plane and go and walk the Camino, Evans. Well, Evans, we're going to take a short commercial okay. break, but we'll be back in just a moment and we'll continue uh, picking your brains and asking about this incredible journey. Okay. A new era in psychic services has begun. PsychicAccess.com You can connect with our psychic advisors by telephone or chat 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. All of our psychic advisors are interviewed, fully verified and accuracy tested, assuring you quality service. We are living in some very troubled times right now. More and more, the world's problems are affecting us on a personal level. You don't have to deal with this alone. Our highly accurate psychics, caring advisors and talented mediums can help with situations you are currently experiencing. 
and can let you know what the future may hold for you. All new customers get a free six-minute reading. All you have to do is register. Why not visit us now and get a free reading at PsychicAccess.com? So Evans, I want to take you back actually to the, the beginning of the journey. Oh, no, sorry, not the beginning of the journey. I want to take you back to the end of the journey when you arrived in Santiago. Uh, tell yeah. us a little bit about how that felt. So you'd completed this incredible walk and arrived in this, this, this third most sacred city. What, was, what were you feeling? What was going on in your mind? Well, first of all, we were so sad to stop our walking. We loved walking so much. Both of us were tearful the final day, thinking, it's over. You know, we, we aren't going to walk anymore. And yet there was also this anticipation that we were finally, finally getting to our goal that we had been working for for five weeks. And, and through those five weeks, we rarely talked about Santiago. It was too far away. It was too much in the distance. Um, so it was only the last week or so we started talking about Santiago. And I realized about a week out that I was going to be arriving right at Pentecost which is one of the holy days in Catholicism, you know, in the church. And it was, a, it was the graduation day of the apostles. Jesus had ascended, and the apostles were sitting in the upper room, including St. James. He was one of the 12 apostles. And they didn't quite know what to do. And this is when the story of the mighty wind came and the tongues of fire came down on the apostles. And they graduated. This was their, their message to go out the gospel of Jesus. Anyway, here I was, it was time, it was Pentecost Day, and I thought, what more perfect day to arrive in Santiago than this holy day, the day of graduation of the apostles. And I really felt like it was my graduation day, too. I had accomplished this, this big monumental goal, physically, emotionally, spiritually, leaving my home for, I was gone seven weeks, which is a long time to be gone. And it was a, just a really triumphal experience, and the, the church is, is glorious. And what I loved about the cathedral in Santiago is all the cathedrals around Europe still have mass every day. They still have these masses. But when you go Santiago, people come from around the world, not necessarily walking, tour buses. You know, it's a major um, tour site in order to go to Mass in order to worship at the bones of St. Saint, Saint James. And so there was so much life in the cathedral. Every day at noon, there's a pilgrim's Mass. First of all, you stand in line and you get your official certificate that you have completed this, um, this long journey. You have a book that you get stamps in every day to prove that you've walked, prove you've been along. And every pilgrim cherishes that, the proof that they have done this. And then you go to Pilgrim's Mass, and there are thousands of people every day at this Mass. It seats a thousand, and there's people along the side, and the, the priest reads the names, the, where the people have come from and how far they've walked. And it's just such a great celebration, and I think there is so much life to that cathedral because there is this active Mass, this active glory to God every day, day in, day out, by thousands of people. And the Santiago Cathedral has a, an amazing, special feature to it, and that's the Bado Fumero, which is an enormous incense sensor that eight men raise up with it, this incense coming out of it, and it, it, they swing it through the entire cathedral, and it's an enormous, um, like, grand finale to have this big show of the incense um, blessing the pilgrims. So, you know, originally it was kind of to help with the smell of the pilgrims because we don't smell all that well after walking. But um, it, it's such a glorious show and the organ is playing and it's just uh, an amazing feeling to have accomplished that and to have made it on foot to see this. And you know, everyone feels like it's just for them. And there are several rituals of the pilgrim 
One we are not allowed to do anymore, which is touch the tree of Jesse as you walk in. That's not allowed, but you still can see it. And you go to see the bones of St. James in the crypt, well, the casket that's in. And then you walk behind the altar and you pet the giant statue of St. James and thank him for the safe arrival. And all of those things that have always been done, you know, just makes you part of that communion of pilgrims and saints. And... Um, it, I was really glad I had arrived in Santiago early. I didn't realize how much I needed extra days there to see my fellow pilgrims because you'd be walking down the street and you'd see somebody you'd seen a week before. And we went to dinner and we talked about our experiences. And I needed those days to reenter. Some pilgrims then walk on to the ocean. I did not have time to walk on the ocean. And I chose to then go to the town of Avila near Madrid to see the convent of Teresa of Avila, one of the great, great saints of uh, the medieval Christian times. And that was kind of my grand finale, was to go to her, her convent and church. And um, so it, it had this kind of wonderful grand ending to this experience, and you felt like you had been blessed, and you took that, you know, I feel like, I feel that blessing still on me from having been in that cathedral. And they have English Mass every day. So I went to the English Mass and so was able to hear the words, these ancient words that have been spoken for thousands of years that have so much meaning. Well, Evans, I want to ask you more about Christianity and particularly your understanding and awareness of esoteric Christianity. Could you explain to us what esoteric Christianity is or stands for? Yes. Well, all religions have, have several levels. There's the level that is the everyday level that is what is mostly talked about and put out. But every great religious tradition has what, an esoteric side. The esoteric side of Islam is Sufism. The esoteric, there's the esoteric side of Judaism, which is the Kabbalah and Kabbalist. And Christianity also has a very esoteric side. Um, in, our, in our lifetimes, I was raised a fundamentalist, literalist Christianity, where every word of the Bible is literally true. And that feeds a large group of people. But when I, as I got older, it no longer fed me. So I started to see gradually Christianity through a, kind of a larger lens of seeing it through myth and story and history and how people thought. But I also, each religion has their grand stories. And the story of Jesus is the grand story of our, um, of our walk to enlightenment. We, we can't get over Jesus. We, we still think of him and, and venerate him because he showed us the way to enlightenment just like the Buddha did. And so when you see Christianity through these much larger lenses and know that all of, all of the, the three great religions I was just talking about, Islam, Judaism, and Christianity, all have their roots in Egypt. Christianity came out of the roots of Egypt, and there's stories about Christ going to Egypt and being initiated in the pyramids. There's stories of Christ going to India and being initiated there. And don't forget, as a, as a baby, Jesus went to Egypt. So Egypt, the great wisdom of Egypt, came out through Christianity, and we're just... Christianity and Judaism and Islam is just the latest version of this great wisdom. And so when we only see it through the narrow literalness, um, we miss the, the beautiful ways it can change our lives. And one of the things that, because I see Christianity different, a little different than the average person, but, and there's, there's beautiful books written about seeing, seeing these things in a different light. And one of the beautiful things I've learned is that the Lord's Prayer, which has been said, you know, billions of times, when you really break it down, it's the beautiful seven great laws of the universe. Hermet the hermeticism is right there in the Lord's Prayer. We say as a, um, you know, 
on earth as it is in heaven. That's the same thing as as above, so below. But one of the great things that really I enjoyed was the, the, the love of the Virgin Mary in the Christian church. And as we went into the age of Pisces, into a much more patriarchal age, we lost the goddess. But we really didn't lose the goddess. The goddess has always been with us in Christianity. She just became the Virgin Mary. And you couldn't go two feet in, in, in Spain without the Virgin Mary being there, holding Jesus. It's the same beautiful statues that we see in ancient Egypt of Isis holding the golden child baby Horus. And um, so as I saw the goddess was everywhere and all these great churches to the goddess, and, and Mary Magdalene was there. I went to some convents of Mary Magdalene as, as her resurgence of, of um, being also the, the other side of Christ, the feminine side of Christ. Um, I just love seeing her in, in the shrines to her and the offerings to her. And I went to one church, um, where the Virgin, the Virgin Blanca, where she was, there were so many miracles there that the Camino changed its course to go through that church to, to venerate this amazing statue. So, you know, I saw what, what most people would not see as the goddess to me, it was that lovely feminine side of God. And, and Jesus is showing us the way to enlightenment. And, and the beauty of the sacraments, of our desire to become and to take on some of the aspects of Christ is through the ritual of the sacraments. So there's so much beauty that can be, can be brought into our everyday lives from seeing it through this bigger picture. We don't we don't have to change religions. We don't we can we can see it in any religion that we we have available to us. And we need to question I think Evans I often feel that God gave us a brain so that we can actually uh, absorb uh, information from different sources and, and consider, cogitate, and arrive at the truth. And the truth is quite simple. You know, you mentioned that the Lord's Prayer is uh, a reference to spiritual truths. There are seven spiritual mm-hmm. truths, and uh, really, I think when we we search for truth and we we question what God would really want. And what God would expect of us, it's actually quite simple. It is. It really is. And I think when you go on a pilgrimage, which is so different than being a tourist, you know, you go with such deep intention and, and you have a different attitude. The good things that happen on the pilgrimage and the bad things, or supposedly bad things, all inform you about who you are. It's the trials and tribulations. And your, your triumph over them, you know, for me, climbing high mountains, one day I had 10 miles in a 30-mile-an-hour headwind, making it more wow. like 20. I didn't think I was ever, and there was no way to stop. But I triumphed over that, and I made it, even though I was exhausted. Um, those inform you where, as a tourist, you might be irritated. Oh, it's raining again. Oh, they've lost my luggage. When you become a pilgrim, you take your you take everything to its lo- simplest, common thing, and so it's easier to have that that joy of being brought into you because you've you've peeled off every layer that the that our modern lives have given us down to down to your mode of transportation. Now that I've been on many pilgrimages that I've driven to that were just as meaningful. But um, we can all do that. We don't have to walk the Camino. We don't have to go to Egypt. We can all pull our lives down to the simplest elements every day to, to find that gratitude and joy and, and triumph over those, those, those tougher times. Those are beautiful words, Evans. That's a wonderful, wonderful message for everybody. It really is. Now, I want to ask you, as you were 
on this experience and facing that that headwind, mm-hmm. uh, struggling but determined to get up get up that hill. Uh, do you do you feel that you were more in tune with? the lessons of life as you walk the Camino. So we say in the, the and I know that you teach tarot, you have an incredible knowledge yeah. of, of tarot. We say that the cards in the major arcana represent the, uh, the lessons, the opportunities, the joys, the sorrows, the struggles of life in human form. Were you able to correlate those lessons, those spiritual truths with experiences along the Camino? Oh, definitely, because every day there was a lesson on the Camino. Camino. There was a challenge, you know, physically, and mentally, emotionally, you know, um, and people you would meet would bring up ideas and, and thoughts, and I had, I had a Kindle with me, so I was reading books, and um, about two weeks into um, the Camino, I was reading a lot of Buddhism because I, as I talk about Christianity, I also really have such great reverence for Buddhism and it has really informed my life greatly. I was reading a book and she says, it's not about finding the answers, it's about losing the questions. And that's a Zen phrase. And that really informed the rest of my trip not about finding the answers it's about losing the questions not about trying to figure out everything of life not trying to figure out exactly what am i supposed to do next you know we're such a goal-oriented society okay you've got to have your plan you've got to have your mission statement and it was about just becoming the question and becoming whatever life presented you in the moment. How are you going to react? Were you going to react with anger? Were you going to be upset? And in one time I, I got lost from Alexandra. I took a wrong turn and she couldn't find me. I couldn't find her. We, my cell phone was dead. How was I going to face that? And I remember saying, you know, okay, angels, I need some help here. I need some help. I can't find my child. You know, how am I going to get out of this? And a few minutes later, on this very empty road, a little car came along with a with some a couple, and I waved them down, and I said, how far is it to here? And I said, can you really please take me? I need to get to this little hotel where we had planned on spending the night. And they took me, and they... The people of Spain are so proud of their Camino. It is so part of their culture. They are so good to the pilgrims, and they are so helpful to us. So they took me to the hotel, and I was able to get a hold of her. And, you know, it was a very anxious moment. You know, we were quite separated. But it resolved itself. You know, we were able to overcome it. And, you know, how did we react in that, in that moment? That, that was kind of part of the process. And um, it, it, was a, it was wonderful to see how we were at our hardest moments as well as our most joyous moments. And I'll tell you, looking at those field of poppies, playing with the calves, petting kittens were such joyous moments. And you well, have nothing uh, to distract you. You have nothing to distract you. All you have is this beauty to look at. Amazing. Well, Evans, tell us, if our listeners now or in the future want to learn more about your journey across the Camino, uh, more about your your knowledge on tarot and your mm-hmm. explorations of spirituality, how can they learn more? How, how can they find you? Well, I've been, I've been writing a blog for a little over a year and a half now, and I did document every day on the Camino. Every morning while my daughter was still asleep, because she wasn't getting up really early, I would send five pictures and about 500 words about the day before. And every day is now on my blog, and it, it, it gives you a real feel for the, the Camino and some of our struggles and some of our joys and what it was like, our day-to-day life on the Camino. So every day is documented on that. And then as I teach tarot, um, 
I, I put up the cards that I've been teaching about and my other spiritual experiences with teachers and my trips to Egypt. And we've talked about Egypt before. I happened to get a front row view to the um, 2011 revolution. I was there at the pyramids when that broke out. And that was an amazing experience to watch the world change. So all of that is on my blog, the perpetualpilgrim.com. And I joke, when I first named it the Perpetual Pilgrim, I thought it was about going to Egypt on air-conditioned buses. But it turns out, when you set, put yourself out like that and say, this is what I'm going to be, um, turns out I had to walk. I had no idea I was going to have to walk as a true pilgrim with my pilgrim staff and my pilgrim shell. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so it's well, be careful Evans, what you I'm, name I'm yourself point. and what you wish for because you're going to become it. So I've decided my <laughs> next uh, website's going to be the Posh Traveler. But for now, it's the Perpetual Pilgrim. The Perpetual and, Pilgrim. And the is that it sounds like an amazing trip for an amazing person, Evans. And it's always a joy to have you on the show. I really well, want to thank you for sharing your experience with us. Well, thank you. I just, I still feel so bubbling over with joy, the joy of we can pure tell. living from the experience. Well, we can tell. I feel uplifted just listening to you, and <laughs> you've shared some very important spiritual messages with us as well. Tell us again, Evans, the website is theperpetualpilgrim.com. Is that correct? Dot com. Yes, it sure is. The Perpetual Great. Pilgrim. Great. Well, thank, thank you, you so, much so much for joining us, Evans. We wish you all the best for your future travels. Well, thank you. I think I'm staying home for at least a week or two. Go oh, good. Little rest. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again. Hello, my name is Res Miranda. If you're having relationship, career, or life issues, I'm inviting you to experience what it's like to have access to professional, highly accurate psychics and spiritual advisors you can trust to care and help you. Register now to get your free six-minute reading by telephone or chat. Get answers. Get access. Psychic access. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. PsychicAccess.com.